kind of the wirely pastor at 90 years old, Pastor John, uh, who wrote the book. And we're trying to put ourselves in his shoes tonight that he has witnessed he was a son of thunder and he was a brash, young, loud mouth kind of a guy. I kept getting himself in trouble as uh, he would speak almost every time. And God really had to work on his heart, really had to master his heart. Um, and so he knew that Jesus was the Savior, but it took him a long time to acknowledge that he was master or, or Lord of his life. And so it took him a while to do that. And so as he's now getting closer to death and his young church or his young group of Christians that are following him, um, something has popped up, a, a group of false teachers have come in and, they're in and they were actually from inside the church so they kind of had a one up on people they had a close relationship with the people and then they started get up, getting up and teaching false teachings so as he's a pastor a spiritual father, a brother a friend, an evangelist um, he's seeing the next generation being deceived by the culture that they're in and um, their faith became rocky because of, of this deceit so what amazes me though is John as a pastor has his finger so on the pulse of the church that he was aware of what was going on. Nothing got past him. And because of his awareness of the church, and that just lets me know he loved them. He was with them daily. He knew them. He knew when they were struggling. Out of that love, it drives him to action. And I see many many church people, uh, I talk about the new generation coming up, and I'm actually, I think I'm only a couple years out of that generation. I'm still an ex, ex guy, and I'm not a millennial. Uh, but I, they say, hey, this generation, there's there's, there's no hope for them. You know, they don't have the same things that we did. And um, they don't believe the same way that we did anymore. And there's just no hope. But as an evangelist, as, as a follower of Jesus, and there's others that have the same feel about this generation, I feel like we're on ground zero. I feel like this is actually good that they don't have the traditions. They don't have the junk that's been kind of put in that we don't have to work through that anymore. But we're actually um, going forward. And this is actually a time that God can actually move afresh again and instead of us saying let's hold up a white flag and give up on them um, but it's actually a, a prime time for God to move so to combat all this um, John doesn't wait for everyone to come to church Think about this. He's not saying, well, I'll, I'll dress this on Sunday morning when I'm teaching. He, he's taking his eyewitness of account of Jesus and his life and how that power that Jesus walked in has changed him and his life, that he's not letting his 90-year-old body stop him from getting the gospel out and loving people. He's telling them the truth about the gospel. And don't get me wrong, teaching inside the church is great, and we, but he's, he's exhausting every way to reach people for Jesus. Today, it might it might look like corresponding people with on Facebook, through email, uh, through text, talk, YouTube, whatever. He's taking advantage of all social media. It was mail back then, sending out letters. But he's taking every avenue to reach them, as well as showing up. We, we read his testimony. He would go to parades uh, and concerts, and he would reach out. It would be like going to coffee shops and evangelism today. He, was, he put himself with people because he loved them so much. That's why it was so hard when he was banished at the end of his life to the Isle of Patmos for preaching, and nobody was there to evangelize. That had to be the worst thing for him. So uh, he's also, he's been promoting the corporate worship that we are to get together on Sundays. We are to do that. But we are to do more than just that. So John desires Christians to operate though what he's been teaching us is that they, he wants them to operate in sound doctrine. He wants them to walk in obedience and do everything that we do out of love for what Jesus has done for us. And all these characteristics that he's talking about, Jesus lived out himself uh, through the scriptures that he saw that more than just on black and white in a paper. He lived it. He, he was with Jesus for three and a half years, day in and day out. He watched him live it. Um, and like James, John is just stressing, hey, it's about progress. And seeking Him. It's not about perfection that we have already arrived, but we're to seek Him. That's why he starts the entire book out in 1 John 1 9. He said, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So He knows we're human. We, have make, we make mistakes. So let's pick it up in verse 29 of chapter 2. So John continues to write. He goes, If you know that He, being Jesus, is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. So he's kind of he's answering an age-old question like, what, what does it mean to be saved? How do, we know it, it, how do we know we're saved? And salvation boils down to, do we really believe that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross was enough to save us? 
That's the question we have to ask ourselves every single day. Because if we wake up and we believe anything different, we'll go a different direction. If we don't believe that, we'll continue to be focused on ourselves. And what I mean by that is if we don't believe we're saved, what are we going to be trying to figure out? How to save ourselves. We're going to be looking to do that. And that's why people start practicing religion versus a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, But we are called to love others because of what Jesus has done for us. But if we're trying to earn righteousness or right standing with God, is is a today's term, then we're not doing it right. So if we're reaching out to people to try to earn our way into heaven... That's not going to be right. If we're serving to earn our way into heaven, that's not going to be right. If we're praying to try to fix our relationship with God, that's not going to be the way to do it. Reading the Bible to earn our way into heaven isn't the way we're going to do it. We're we're operating in love when we do that, but it's only love for ourselves. We're only concerned about me. And that's exactly what Jesus taught against, that we need to be genuinely reaching out toward other people because I've already taken care of that part for you. So when the Pharisee in Luke 10 was worried about kind of his own skin, when he was asking Jesus, he said, Hey, what should I be doing? What's the two great commandments? What was he really asking? What do I have to do to barely squeak in to get into heaven? That's exactly what he was asking. And Jesus answered, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, soul and strength. The second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the guy, he was just worried about, hey, what rules get me into heaven? And Jesus was teaching, hey, I want you to believe that I've already paved the way for you, that it's already done so you can rest in that, so you can be free to love everyone else assured that you are taken care of. You're free to do that. He goes on in chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that he should be called or that we should be called children of God, and so we are. What does God's love look like? Well, I think the first Christian answer, which is actually right, is to say what? We saw it when he sent who? Jesus Christ to die on the, on the cross. That's the picture that he gave everything for us to reach out to us. He gave us his son. But practically, what really happened? Think about that for a minute. What does that really mean? I know we know Jesus died, but what happened spiritually, what happened to us is we, when we did that, we, we said, hey, we recognize that Jesus saved us. So what, would, what do we do? We practically allow him to what? Master our hearts. Not that the price has already been paid. Hey, this God has something for me bigger and better than I've ever had. He mastered my heart. So John explains this of, of how to see God's love. If you go back into his gospel. So write this down. I want you guys to look this up because this is a key verse in scripture. It's John 17, 23. Go back and read it over and over and over again after tonight. It says, being Jesus, he says, I in them being us and you being God and me, that they may become perfectly one. So he's, he's uniting who? God, the Son, and us back together. And we know the Holy Spirit's in there as well. But he's saying, look, I'm, I'm perfecting them as one again. I'm, I'm fixing that broken relationship that man broke. I want to fix that. Then he goes on to say, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. That word as is so important. It's the smallest little word in that scripture. But if you go back in the Greek and read what it means, it, it's talking that it's, it means to the same degree. So think about that. So us being God's adopted children, when we're saved, we're, we're kind of brought in. We're like, you know, we're kind of the step kids or, or we're the adopted kids. Maybe, you know, we just kind of squeaked in. But what Jesus is telling here that John heard through his ears and he's proclaiming to us through this, this, uh, the entire gospel and through this book is that God not only loves us, he loves us exactly the same as he loves Jesus, his only begotten son. There's no difference. And that blows my mind that if we can understand that fact, it changes everything. So when God asks us to do something, it's not, it doesn't become just obedience anymore. I would, be, I would say it's foolish not to do it. He loves me. I'm going to follow Him. We are not obedient to try to save ourselves. We become obedient because we are fully saved, is what John keeps talking about over and over again. Not only did Jesus take our place on the cross, but think about what that verse has implication of. So he took our place on the cross, and then he gifted us his place where? In heaven, right beside God. He said, I'm going to take your place, your penalty for what you did, and you get to sit in heavenly places with my Father instead, and never experience the wrath of God for all the sins that you willingly and not willingly committed. 
So Jesus, his gift is his place. A true son, a true daughter. That's who we are. And... Yep, I should have numbered these. So again, so that's where he's saying we are true children. We're not, even though we're adopted by contract, we're truly his. God sees us as his fully in his heart. And he finishes verse 1 by saying, The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So there's already a built-in friction. We, we saw how they treated Jesus. How did they ultimately treat him? They hung him up on a cross and killed him. They, they didn't like his message, not, not what he did, not how he acted, because what? Crowds flocked around him. But his message of, I'm here to rule and reign over you like I created you for, and what do they say? No, we don't want that. We like the benefits, but we don't like you in charge. We want to be in charge. And that friction, unfortunately, gives some believers in us, uh, or in our time today and then, it kind of gives an us and them mentality. That, you know, like, hey, there's the world, and then there's us. But Jesus would teach, it's only about Jesus. It's not about us and them. And what does he call us to do? Second great commandment. We're to love all of them. We're to figure out. We're to, and then out of that, so once we understand that it's only about Jesus and we're to love all of them, that's where Jesus, when the woman caught the jewel tree, when she saw that, she says, He loves me. He doesn't condemn me. He wants to save me. What did he do? What do you say then? Go and sin no more. And it doesn't say she ever did. So she understood through Jesus' love what that actually meant. That, look, you know, I enjoyed this stuff before. I was caught in it. I did it. But I understand Jesus has something far better for me, and she moved on from it because of his love. Um, they didn't want Jesus, so what does that mean for you and I today? They're not going to want us. Everybody raise your hand. They're not going to want us. Why? Because we're, we're proclaiming that what? Jesus is Lord and Savior. Master, Lord over our lives. But what went out in the end? After Jesus died, after He gave His heart, or after He, gave, he showed His heart, but He gave His life and showing it, what happened? The gospel did what? It blew up. Everybody that said, crucify Him weeks earlier, it was just a few weeks after, and they're saying what? We're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. We saw Him. So after Christ's love, it, and they saw it sacrificed on the cross, it won over the hardened hearts, it won over farmers and kings, it won over cities and nations. Why? Because they really want to be loved. They saw it. They didn't understand it when he was informed, but after they saw what he meant by what he was saying, it was too late to love him in the flesh. But now he's saying, it's not too late to love me. I'm still here. I still provided for you. I'm alive. I'm a well. And you can serve me right now with your life. And as Christians, people need to see the sacrifice of love. Just like Annette and Samantha that was in here just a minute ago. Have never experienced it. The only, the only thing they ever had with a pastor was a pastor who met them at the door and if she didn't pay him to get in the service, she would not be allowed to be in. Is that love? It has nothing to do with it. It's not about great preaching or beautiful buildings or flyers. They need to see Jesus living and alive in us. That's the only way. And that's where John picks up in verse 2 and says, Beloved, we are God's children. Everybody say that word with me. Now. Okay, everybody say it again. When are we God's children? Now. So the emphasis is that word, now. He stops it. He ends there. He say we are to live in the kingdom of God as His children now. Not in retirement. Not when our kids are grown. Not when we get married. Or not when we have the perfect job or our whole life is put together. He's saying, I want you to live now. And don't get me wrong. All those areas are ways that we can live as God's children. But it's saying we're to live now. Live as God's children now. And he goes on to say in verse 2, And what we will be as not yet appeared, talking about Jesus' second coming, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So Jesus will return, but has he returned yet? No, we're still here, we're still breathing, we're still kicking. So the world believes, hey, out of sight, out of mind. They don't care. They, you know, he hasn't come back yet. I can do whatever I want. Eat, drink, and be merry. But John is saying, through us living out our faith now, who will they see? 
Jesus. Prior to him ever coming back, they will still stand face to face with him. Why? Because they're seeing him alive in us. And even though humanity rejects the rule of Jesus, they don't, they don't want to be mastered by him. They actually long for his characteristics. So think about this. It's going to go right with the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus was gentle. He had gentleness. When the pain in the neck of the children of the city came rushing up to him, what did the disciples say? Hey, go away. And Jesus said what? Don't suffer them to come to me. Those are my kids. He had peace when he rescued the woman caught in adultery. Everybody else was ready to stone him. And he's like, that's not what we're here to do. I'm here to save individuals. He had joy when he raised who? His friend Lazarus from the dead. He, was, he had goodness. Why do we know that? Because the sinners around him when he was accused, what did they call him? Friend. He had goodness. He had kindness as he restored the woman at the well from all of her reputation. He walked in authority, commanding the winds and the waves that were out of control. He had, he had total self-control when he had to drive out the money changers who were taking advantage of the people of Jerusalem. He had patience for the scribes and Pharisees, those hypocrites who were religious just like us. We've been there at times. We've done it. He had self-control and patience. He had faithfulness to see all the, all the way through to the cross. And He had love to take our place on the cross and gift us His. All that sounds really good, right? The world loves that message. But they reject the one what? I like the Savior part. I don't like the Master part. I don't like that. So John is proclaiming that is who we are because the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same one out of that grave flows through us today that we live now. Everybody say it. Now as children of God that others might see Him too. And he picks it up in verse 3 and says, And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. If Jesus is our hope um, and we know that one day He will return, what does that mean? That we are to purify ourselves. Not by religion. It means we are to set ourselves aside for His glory, for Him to use us in complete submission as Savior, as Lord. We are to allow Him to rule and reign in us so that the Holy Spirit can master others' hearts as well. How many of you, if you had a family member who was in absolute danger, I mean, their life was in jeopardy. You knew where they were. You knew the situation. What would you do to get to them? Everything, right? Nothing short of even putting your own life in jeopardy. I'd be speeding down the runway. I'd be wherever I needed to get to them to save them. I would do that. And Jesus has asked us to reach out to our brothers and sisters who are still not saved. They still don't know Him. That's what He's asking us to do. And in verse 4 He goes on to say, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So this word practice in the Greek refers to those who continuously practice sin. And, not, and they have no remorse of it. And that's a simple equation. If they're, not, if they're not following the Lord, then what do they still are? They're still not saved yet. They don't know Him. They haven't been introduced to them. They practice sin to become better at sinning. That's why you practice it. You indulge in it. You don't, you don't go to the batting cage and take swings all day long if you're not wanting to do what? Hit the ball. So that's what they're doing. They're practicing it. So, it's not, so in verse 5, he goes on to say, you know that He appeared in order to take away sins. And in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. So Jesus, He came to defeat sin. And what did He do? He left His perfect gift, the Holy Spirit, to stand with us to deal with the problem of sin. So anyone walking in blatant sin and is unwilling to repent, what are they? they just don't know Jesus yet. So what is our job to do? To make Him known to them. So to clarify, this is not speaking of those who fail and have mistakes in their life while practicing righteousness. They're practicing righteousness and missing the swings. You're going to swing at the bat and the ball, but you're going to do what? You're going to miss it more times than you're going to hit it. But we're practicing to hit it. They're practicing to miss it. And that's why John started with the verse in one nine. If we confess our sins, God is ready to forgive. When we miss while we're practicing righteousness, we, there's a built-in forgiveness clause in that relationship with Him. I, I've already, I know about those mistakes. That's why I had to come. And then verse 7, he picks it up. We'll go through the end. 
So he goes back to that beautiful phrase. He calls us little children. So Grandpa John, just loving on us as, as the next generation leaving this for us. He goes, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. Does it say those that are perfect in righteousness? No, they're practicing it as he is righteous. There's only one that is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born again, or born by, of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love God. His brother. So having a new relationship with Jesus automatically creates what? A new relationship with sin. It's different. Like, you know, I know what Jesus did for me now. And when God says the wages of sin is what? Death. I believe that. I saw it on the cross. I saw what it was meant to do to me. I understand what he's trying to keep me away from. Even though I don't understand it all the time, I know he loves me and has my best interest in heart. I'm going to do it. So when we open the word, though... Even I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. If it's a day, if it's 50 years. When we open the Word, there should still be conviction in our heart. Why? Because we'll never measure up in this form. Not until we're with Him, we'll never measure up. And that conviction should be there. And it's showing us what? Aries, we still have to grow. And He's a gracious God. He doesn't overwhelm us. He chisels away slowly and slowly the things. And He's not, he's not a master who comes in and breaks us. He's a master who loves us into submission. And we willingly will say, take my life. Use me. And that conviction of sin in our life, it only comes through what? Who do you leave behind? The Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, that is a sign of what? That I am a born again believer. So there's always... So the moment that we look at the Word and we say, you know what, I'm, I'm good in that area. That's when we have to start being worried. I've already arrived in that area. But as long as we're having that conviction, not condemnation, but conviction that, hey, I still have a long way to go. And that's okay. It's about progress, not perfection. And I have the Holy Spirit prompting me. Because if, if an unbeliever reads the Scriptures and is not convicted, I understand that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's not living in them. He will woo them, but not until that final moment when they're about to give their life over to Him, will they, they will say, you know what? I'm good. I'm good the way I am. But John points out that whoever is a believer and who is and who is not, so we so we so why would why do we do this? Who's a believer and who's not? Does that mean that we create the us and them policy? No, because he's going to go on in the next part of the this chapter, which we're not getting into tonight, and teach us how to love one another. He's saying, look, you need to understand who you're dealing with. Is it an unbeliever or is it a believer so that we know how to love them? Not that we hold back our love, but how do we get them from, okay, I'm dealing with an unsaved person. How do I get them saved? Where do I have to introduce them? Or am I dealing with a saved person who needs correction in the Word and I'm loving them? So He's teaching us, here's how to see it so that you know where to go. You know how to pray for them. So are we evangelizing someone or are we maturing them in love? That's what um, John will uh, keep teaching over and over and over again. And he keeps calling his little children, grow up, mature, and walk in the love that Christ gave. I saw it. I felt it. I, I heard his voice. I saw him live it out. And he's living it out in me. I know he's still alive. Let's pray.